setting it up. And I think we're good to go. Awesome. Okay, got it. Um, hi, everybody who are watching tonight. Welcome back. Happy New Year. Uh, happy 2022. It's been a slice. I don't know what it's like for everybody else in different provinces, but we here in Ontario have been super locked down with a whole bunch of Zoom school, and it's been fantastic. So anybody who's watching tonight, have a big old glass of wine in your hand because I feel you. Um, tonight, my guests are Melanie, Kim, and Eleanor. They are all veterans, no pun intended, of this show, um, and some of my favorite people to talk to. And tonight, we are talking about what I wish I had known. And I feel like this is such a loaded question. And I can't wait to hear what everybody has to say. So welcome to uh, to my three favorite ladies. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for having and us. Thanks. It'll be fun. Um, so let's just let's just jump right into things. So the, the before we do anything else, I want you guys to introduce yourselves. So why don't we start with you, Al? Um, talk about kind of how you became a military family, what life looks like, um, what stage you're at right now in terms of life. And uh, I suppose, you know, what Tom is up to these days. Yeah, for sure. So I first got introduced to the military when I was at university in Guelph. Um, Guelph has a reserve unit, an artillery unit there. So, you know, like most stories, it starts off the bar, all these very, you know, good looking men in uniform kind of spill in after their parade night. Um, and one of them happened to be Tom. So we were friends first, and then we started dating. And, um, you know, we always knew he was, he was going to do it for life. You know, there was like no um, hesitation where he was like, I'm just in the reserves for now, but I'm going to be right for. So I went in with my eyes wide open. And after a few different um, remusterings, he ended up in the infantry. Um, he ended up um, with um, three PPCLI in the paratroop company. Um, he did that for a number of years. We were long distance for a very large chunk of our relationship, you know, different provinces, different countries when he deployed twice to Afghanistan. Um, and then after like very high paced garrison life, um, his uh, sort of relaxation posting was to Kingston where he um, has been working at our, the Royal Military College for about three years doing various positions. And now he's the drill sergeant major there. So never a dull moment. Um, we have a lovely six-year-old son um, Ethan, who now apparently his favorite game to play is um, having his dad yell army commands at him as he marches around. That is a new thing. Um, it's very cute because ever since Remembrance Day and he's sort of aware, he now salutes every time the national anthem plays at school. Also cute, but you kind of, you know, you know you're in a military family. When? When? <laughs> so and throughout it all, like my career has been, you know, in um, politics, I've been lucky enough to be gainfully employed at you know, every, um, you know, every posting, which I know not every military spouse is. Um, so it's been interesting. Politics with someone who's not supposed to be political in his day job. So that's been fun. Awesome. Thanks, Els. Uh, Kim, welcome back. Tell us about your military family. <clears throat> I feel like I do that enough. Um, what I married my, the kid I went to school with, the one that your parents tell you that you will not get married to. Um, when we were 19, that's when I learned everything about the military because I didn't know anything at that point. We were in Calgary. Um, we, I moved up with him for his first posting, which was in um, Edmonton. He, he's uh, an armored uh, soldier. He, uh, it was before 9-11 when we got married. So um, that changed really, really quickly. He did, uh, we had three kids. He did a few tours to Afghanistan. Um, in a very short succession. And then uh, since then he's been to Kingston, we were there. He was part of the disaster assistance response or whatever that is, um, and the non-combatant evacuation. And then uh, he went on task force Iraq and then we came back here. Um, thing about combat trades, they kind of like just hang out in the same place and nobody agrees to move them anywhere nice. So Edmonton is kind of where we end up. And so he's been back here for quite a few years. Um, yeah, and, and he went to Latvia recently. Um, I have three kids. My oldest is already an adult. He's in the reserves. He's a member of the King's Own Calgary Regiment. 
Um, and then I have a 16 year old and a 14 year old. Um, and uh, yeah, my husband is actually on the first time ever in 20, almost 23 years, I guess, um, that he is not deployable just for this one short school year of a period he is taking French. Oh, so. okay. good. Yeah. Awesome. Has it, what's it been like having him home for an extended period of time? Um, I mean, he goes to school and comes back at least. So like he leaves the house, but uh, <laughs> um, it's interesting. I don't, we've never, it really legitimately like by the time he hit about the six month mark of school, September, October, November, December, January. So we're hitting about the six month mark at school, which would make it, um, I think the longest time that he's ever like not gone anywhere ever in like more than 20 years. So um, yeah, it's, he is learning to do more around the house. I am still like, and he is a very helpful person. Like he's the person that does laundry and he's the person that vacuums and he's very clean and he's very um, gung ho for that. But you certainly do realize that like the whole house is, is modeled around me and how I can manage things because that's how it works. So um, and I'm not necessarily willing to give up all of my um, planning to him when like it's just a year, like it's not like he's going right. to be here to do it for the rest of his life. So um, we are finding a balance there. But uh, I think for him more than anything, it's nice that he gets a chance to recoup his time for a little bit because he's yeah. never he's never got to have that kind of downtime. So that's awesome. And Mel, what's your military family look like? You you uh, you were military, too, weren't you? For a Yes. So that's how my husband and I met when I got posted to Edmonton back in 2005 after basic training. Um, my husband was my sponsor and I yelled at him and he fell in love immediately, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together ever since. So we have been to, um, we started in Edmonton where... He went to Afghanistan from there and I discovered that I was just really exceptional at telling people how things should be done and not so great at being told how to do things. So I got out and since then we've been to Comox, Greenwood, Gander, and now we're here in Trenton. He transferred to search and rescue in 2008. So we went from long periods of time with him away for deployments and field exercises and that sort of thing to much shorter missions with, you know, <laughs> no regularity to our calendar. Uh, we also, he did the French course during um, COVID. So he was doing virtual school and I was doing virtual school and the kids were doing virtual school. And they say that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And it's so very true. <laughs> <laughs> so he's back at work now. Uh, he has five years to go or seven or 10 or, you know. <laughs> just depends on the day. And we've got two little boys who are 10 and eight. Um, I spent 12 years as a paramedic and I'm currently in my final semester of the Occupational Health and Safety Program at Ryerson University or X University, depending on which team you're playing on. Um, and then I will hopefully be headed into um, helping veterans plan their next steps. Awesome. That's awesome. Thanks. Well, thank you everybody for being here. I really wanted to do this show today. I've done, I did this a year ago, but I feel like there's just so much more that we need to get into. Um, and I did it with other guests and I, I wanted to call this show what I wish I had known because the three of you have spent a, a tremendous amount of years now as a military family. You've experienced so much. And I would love for the three of you to be able to speak to individuals who either can completely relate to you, but mostly individuals who might be getting in and are in their new years and sitting there like deer in headlights being like, what the hell did I just do? And any good advice that you can give them of like what you wish you had known at the time when you didn't know, um, I feel like could be really helpful. So my very first question is what was it like getting into the military? So like very first experiences because you both really knew your spouses like right kind of at that entry point. Were you prepared? Did anybody give you any information? And what do you wish people had told you? Um, let's go backwards this time. Mel, let's start with you. Um, so my husband and I joined the military independent of one another. He's from Kelowna, BC, and I'm from PEI. So um, talk about opposite ends of the country. Yes. <laughs> and for us, it was really a career-oriented approach. And so then we kind of built the fully goal. 
So the really big thing for us when we were deciding how we were going to live our lives was at that point, the operational was really, really high with Afghanistan. And for the medical trade, we tend to have a lot of intermarrying. Um, medics marrying medics and medics marrying nurses and nurses marrying medics. And it's, you know, we, we like one another. <laughs> and we saw a lot of our colleagues getting divorced or having just really huge challenges because you'd come home from exercise at four o'clock in the morning and your spouse would leave at six o'clock in the morning for whatever their exercise was. And there was so much, um, you're basically just, you're coming home to take care of the kid that they can go. And it was really hard to manage those two schedules. So we knew as we were talking about where we wanted our relationship to go, we wanted somebody who was going to be at home, who was not going to be subject to that military schedule because you don't have control over that. And so we wanted one stable person who wasn't going to be going to Wainwright ever. And I was super comfortable never going to Wainwright again. So I took that bullet. <laughs> And so is that some, and uh, back back then, did you have kids at the time or you didn't have kids? We did before? not. You did not. And so is that more like is your 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 speaking? It's interesting because you you bring a perspective of getting into the military for the very first time, but you also get to speak to the experience of of a dual service couple. Mm -hmm. um, what did that conversation look like? And how did you decide that it was going to be Zuko that continued on and that you were going to step away and do something else? Oh, it was not hard. I was bad at the military. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really, really happy in my civilian job. I really liked being a paramedic. I liked working within my community. There were things that I wanted to do within the military, but I started as a volunteer firefighter and I did my paramedic program after that. And so a lot of my career goals were really home-based and I that is what I wanted to focus on. I was really there are interesting and really unique and just fantastic experiences that you can have within the military, but I was comfortable not having them. I knew that there was a lot that I could do at home that was still really worthwhile. And there was, there were a lot of challenges that he still wanted out of the military. He wanted to go into a star course. He wanted to be able to do that travel. And I was okay with not doing it with being and, at home. And knowing that that was going to be the case and that you guys were going to go take different career path journeys, um, what's something that you would have told your younger self at the time when 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 you both were, were entering the military or deciding to take different career paths, but knowing that there were going to be some challenges with um, military life from maybe what you had known before? There are a lot of sacrifices to adult life, no matter where you are, no matter which path you take. And that is part of building a life. That is part of building a family. You're not going to be able to have everything and you have to pick which things you can't live without hmm. and which things you're comfortable letting go of. Good advice. Kim, you've known Nathan forever. Um, it was very clear that he was going to take the military path. Um, what's something that you wish you had known kind of coming into this experience or what's something that surprised you um, as Nathan started going on this military journey and, and you were taking that journey with him? You know what? I, I'm i kind of glad I didn't know anything. So um, I don't Would know. Would you turn around and run? <laughs> well, and I mean, I don't think, I mean, every single life is you don't know what's coming. I don't care if you marry someone in the military, you marry someone who's not, you don't know what life's going to throw at you. I mean, I think COVID taught people a lot about what it looks like to just have things randomly change. Maybe, you know, military families have been doing that kind of pivoting for a little bit longer, but at the end of the day, like, you don't know if one of the spouses is going to get sick. You don't know who's going to keep their job. You don't know, you know, what your financial future looks like or what your kids or plans are. I mean, you just don't know. So I don't, I, I get asked that a lot. I mean, we have the, the, she is first stickers. The like, you knew what you were getting into stickers. Um, because it's, a you know, everybody kind of throws that out at you, but I legitimately just don't think that anybody really can plan too far in advance or really understands what they're looking at. If anything I've learned about the military and, you know, the five or six years that I've been doing, you know, more traveling and visiting and meeting military spouses, it's that there's, 
not a lot of similar experiences Mm -hmm. and me explaining to spouses what I think that they need to know would look a lot like my in-laws explaining to me what they thought we should know because they had been in the military you know 20 years prior to us getting married and at the end of the day it was older experience that wasn't going to replicate itself I mean Mm -hmm. The, the spouses I meet now, I could tell them all kinds of things about what the first, you know, decade of marriage looked like for us. But um, it's unlikely that, you know, the the next generation of spouses is going to deal with something like Afghanistan or, you know, that the same kinds of issues, even if another conflict comes up, it's not going to look exactly the same. Life mm-hmm. has changed. Technology has changed. The military has changed. So in the end, I don't really give people a lot of like, this is what you have to expect because even in this, you know, group of three, I don't have the same experiences as Eleanor or as Mel. I wouldn't even begin to know how to explain to someone what it would be like marrying someone who was a SAR tech or um, who was a reservist or who was inf- like, I, I just wouldn't. So I don't know that there's, you know, one particular thing that I wish I had known other than, um, we were 19 when we got married um, back in a time when they absolutely did sit you down and ask you if you thought it was a good idea because you had to write a memo in order to get married. Um, They definitely did that with my spouse because he was 18 when he put in his marriage memo. And we heard all of the stories, not just as young kids getting married who were told constantly how you'll get divorced and you shouldn't get married and whatever, Um, but also about the military and everybody in the military gets divorced and it's hard and you're not gonna be able to make it work. And there's so much stress and nobody ever sat us down and said, you know, the best chance you have of making it is if you're both in, you're both wanting to, to make it work. Um, And I've seen a lot of marriages and a lot, um, but I've seen some really good ones all across the board of military life that have made it. And they're all ones where I could say that I think the spouse um, was as committed to making things work as the member. It wasn't the member pulling them along and being like, no, you said you'd hate it, but I bet you learned to love it. It was always someone who was willing to put as much time in as the other person. And I think that's probably the most valuable piece is that if you really don't want to do it, you probably shouldn't. Um, but I really don't want to do a lot of things and I don't like that other people do right like I went through COVID yes my spouse was deployed during COVID and it was really lonely and we didn't see him for a really long period of time because of the travel restrictions and stuff but I also didn't worry about where his next paycheck was coming from when I got laid off we still had an income um there's a lot of things that I didn't have to put up with that other Canadians did have to so um at the end of the day I don't know that there's a way that we can plan ahead. I honestly look at myself at that like 19 year old that was getting married. There's this, like a whole bunch of real naive and adorable high school looking photos of my husband and I on our wedding day. I don't know that I would have tried to ruin her life by giving her some big story about how it was all going to turn out. Like she was going to have to figure it out on her own anyway. So no, I actually love what you just said. First of all, I love everything that you just said, but I love the fact that you touched upon that perhaps you couldn't get that advice because everybody's experience is so different. And that, and that, you know, just in this room alone with the three of you, that, that um, all three of your lives were going to go such different ways simply because of the nature of the military that to try to give advice and be like, this is what it's going to be like would be silly because it's it's like you said, nobody's experience is different. But that being said, Elle, I'm still going to ask you the same question um, because I want to hear your perspective. Um, Is there something that, first of all, do you think you were prepared? Like, was, is there anything in the military that as a spouse you get, is there like a course or is there anything that like prepared? I I love how Mel's like rolling her eyes. She's like, what are you ridiculous? Is there, is there anything that's like, this is like military life 101, like welcome spouse. Like, here's what you should be expecting. Is there anything like that that you experienced? No. And I mean, when I think back on it, it would have been sort of nice. I mean, you know, maybe it's just my job or my personality. I like to know things. Now, I was very, very fortunate in the fact that, you know, even though Tom was a reservist, which could have been very different than his life as a Reg Force member, he was a full-time reservist. So a lot of the time reservists have, you know, they're either going to school and they go like one day a week, there's a couple of weekend exercises and and they choose if they would like to, they can do a summer away. It looks very different. And I think it would have been a much bigger shock to my system if that's 
the way it had been when I met Tom, like if he was just a student like me, you know, where Thursday nights he put on a uniform and, you know, did some mysterious thing. And then he was away a couple of weekends. But when I met him, he was all in, um, you know, working like nine to five, you know, at the armory. He taught multiple courses over the summer. So, you know, when my university ended and I was like, yeah, let's do stuff and things. And he was like, see you in four months. Like I'm going to Meaford. And I mean, we're talking, I met Tom in 2003. Um, so like there were no smartphones. There were really cool flip phones, um, <laughs> you know, so there wasn't a lot of texting going on and Meaford for whatever reason is like a dead cell zone. So, you know, if he actually wanted to speak to me, if he could, and he wasn't, you know, in a field somewhere, um, you know, he was standing on, you know, on top of something like, you know, oh my God, I need cell service. So like, I just didn't see him. I would say that prepared me the best for him joining the regular forces. Right. Because when they're gone, they're gone. Now I know that other spouses have a different experience. Tom is very focused in his job. And so I know, you know, lots of people who had a different experience than me where their spouse, what did, you know, make a point to text them every single day or make an effort to communicate with them, which is totally fine. Uh, like Tom is so focused on his job, everything about himself and sometimes his family comes last over all of his guys. So I think I was prepared for that. I think what's different about the reserves um, as well is you know, yeah, there's some social stuff, but like I met like his, his friends in the military rather than spouses in the reserves. You know, I don't know if it's because a lot of them were younger, like they didn't necessarily have partners. Um, so it was, it was like very different. Like it was a different sense of community. I would say not as much of a community. And then, you know, I totally agree with, with a lot of what Kim said it's such a different experience for everyone. And I think it depends on your personality also, like how you approach it. For me, I'm like all in. So I definitely agree with Kim. Like if you, if you're in, like you have to be in, you know, you can't just be sort of like halfway in where you're like, oh, I think I can support you when you're away for eight months of the year. Like if you can't, don't, and that's okay. You know, that is okay. There are other people out there, but if you're, you know, someone that can't manage that, I, I think it's very tough on your spouse right. who's in um, the military where they're, you know, kind of constantly concerned um, about what's going on at home and distracted. That being said, like, would I like Tom to text me more than he did? Absolutely. You know, would I like to come slightly higher on the priority list? You know, if he had a few, five, sure. But, you know, he never lied to me about that. And um, I was also very lucky that he likes to know things as well. You know, it's amazing. Like, you know, you, I would talk to some of his guys when he was in the reg force, like privates and corporals, and they like don't know how to navigate the system because nobody tells them either. Tom made it a point to be like, how can I game this? How can I figure this out? Like, what are the answers? How can I manage 19 different computer programs organizing my life? So that when I asked him a question, he knew the answer mm -hmm. or he could find the answer. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like the flow of information was at a level where I like felt like comfortable, you know, with it. If someone asked me like, oh, what does Tom do? Like I could actually articulate what it was that he, that he did um, mm -hmm. on a far more articulate basis. And, yeah. and for me, that gave me comfort. So I like knew what he was doing. That's awesome. I still can't do that. <laughs> and that's okay. But for me, like, if I don't know things, I like make stuff up in my head and it goes in a very like bizarre, not good direction. Um, so I, I think I really appreciated the fact that he was patient and answered all my questions. Um, the one thing that I wish he hadn't done in the beginning, and maybe you're gonna ask this later, is um, like, he was very rose colored glasses. And then I was constantly disappointed. He was like, well, I, I'm not going on this exercise. And I'm like, great, you know, planning stuff. And then it was like, oh, like I'm going. And it felt like a last minute thing. And so I finally sat him down and I said, like, you need to spread out the training calendar for me and be like, I understand it changes 19,000 times. Tell me now so that I'm not counting on you. And if you're there, great. And if you're not, like, I knew you were going to be away. Right. Um, so he very quickly learned to come home and be like, here are the possibilities. Right. 
And then, you know, once a month, we would sort of like reconcile our calendars, be like, this has changed, and this has changed, and this has changed. I'd be like, no problem. Right. No, I, I, I can't imagine as a total type A control freak over here, like not knowing. And it seems like there's a lot of not knowing that in the military as a spouse or as a family, you have to be okay with. And, and what I like about that and what I've met, you know, what I've learned from so many military families is that they're just so much more uh, generally from what I'm, when I see and what I hear is that there's this like versatility that there's this like go with the flow nature that, you know, it's, it doesn't always have to be planned that they're, that, you know, they're, that there's, there's this strength behind, you know, knowing there's constant change. And, and I think that's, that's, un, that's amazing. Um, I want to talk about, I want to talk about deployments for a second. And I, and I, the very first thing what I want to talk about is for those who are watching, who are not familiar with the military, I think there's this misnomer and I think you've all experienced it, but there's this misnomer that every single person goes on a deployment and the deployment looks like you're gone for a year or eight months or something like that away from your family. But that's not always the case. And I want to say, um, and I know uh, it, um, in your case, the three of you have all experienced deployments to Afghanistan. So that could be true in some cases. But I want to point out Mel for a second, who's um, Zuko, Zuko is a SAR tech, mm -hmm. you know, which is very different than some of the other, um, you know, Navy deployments or Army deployments that may happen. Mel, tell us what, um, and then I want to go to Ellen Kim and to kind of explain what this looks like before I ask my question. But what does a deployment look like? If you're a SARTAC family. So for the SAR family, it's very different from when we were Army. So like when we were Army, there was pre-deployment training, which could take up to a year. And it involved multiple smaller, like three or four month exercises away, a six to eight-ish month deployment. And then, you know, you're home again. And with search and rescue, it's um, kind of like being on call all of the time and by kind of actually um, and so they have a, a rotating schedule that they're either actually on call or they are on backup so I mean he's on backup right now so if the phone rings that something has happened tonight then he's going to go into work and be gone for a while till it's done um, once a call goes out, then they can be gone for usually not more than a week um, for a mission. But, you know, you're going to the Arctic or you're going into the mountains or you're going something marine. And depending on what the search is, depending on who you're looking for or what you're looking for, you're gone until you find it. And so it's a really unpredictable schedule that you can't you can't plan around. We almost plan for everything. Like he's not going to be here. And then if he gets to come, then we're like, okay, great. Bonus. Right. We just assume he won't be there. Um, and then there's various training exercises and things like that mixed in where they're down to um, their dive skills. They have to keep up. They do uh, Arctic training. They do skydiving. They do all kinds of stuff that they have to go away for to keep up the various star skills. So it's, much shorter deployments than your average trade, but far more often. Um, so I think that's a really, really good point. And again, just trying to like get rid of some misconceptions. Kim and, and Elle, talk about, just explain a little bit about, you know, deployment versus kind of training or things that might need to happen leading up to that deployment that can still take an individual away from home. Because I think there's a lot of the, you know, the general civilian population that they don't realize it's not just, okay, I'm gone for eight months and now I'm back. And now I'm going to be here for an indefinite period of time. What, is, what does that actually look like? I think there's been um, a shift in, I mean, when I got married, when we first started out, like deployment always meant um, in the army, even especially, I guess I didn't know much about anything else. Um, that six to 12 month deployment overseas, like that's what that word always signified to us. Um, I would say that it doesn't always anymore. They deploy to Wainwright for training. Um, they deploy locally for, um, you know, domestic deployments, um, fires and floods and, and things like that. Um, you know, there's courses, um, training, 
So, I mean, yeah, there's, you know, my husband, I would usually use the phrase like he has five deployments. And I think it was actually in one of these that I said that. And then someone else, um, you know, made a comment that their spouse had, you know, uh, significantly more, I think it was like close to 20 deployments, but the word deployment meant something different to them. It meant absences. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just a different way that we're all looking at the same mm -hmm. word. Um, I know for us, my spouse generally has, I mean, the first deployment to Afghanistan, he was on the very first one. So there wasn't like workup training or anything like that. They just left. Um, and that was six months. And then, but then the next two Afghanistan deployments, yeah, they had, you know, three, four months that they were gone in Texas. They were gone in Germany. They were gone to Wainwright um, before they would actually go to Afghanistan. Um, and then those were between, you know, six or eight months or whatever. And then uh, he went to Task Force Iraq, which was, I think, about six months. He went to Latvia, um, which ended up being longer because of COVID. Um, whether or not there's an HLTA, again, COVID stopped them recently. There also wasn't HLTA in the first deployment to Afghanistan. I mean, they're not a standard either. And that's for when those, they get to come for, home for those home. watching him, what is a HLTA? Yeah, when they get to, sorry, I, <laughs> I realized at the end, when they get to come home. In the non military middle, talk um, for a second. Yeah. Or when we get to meet up with them, they usually get 16 or 18. I don't even know how much it is, but they get some time off usually at some point during a deployment if it's more than six months or exactly six months. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, he's in his career been on a whole heck of a lot of courses because that's the nature of his career um and then he you know goes oh I think we lost Kim there for a second it's a year um and then yeah I tease him about the amount of time that he spent in BC or uh, Manitoba because those are all the domestic floods yeah. and fires and things yeah Al, what about you? Have you kind of experienced that same thing? Like that, that idea that, as a, you know, a deployment isn't always what everybody sort of the, the general population believes it is, you know, especially when we talk about like Kim and Mel's idea of like, there are so many different kinds of absences. And I think people have this one preconceived notion of what that looks like. How, how does that look like for you? So, I mean, I think the, the army in particular has sort of um, different terminology for it. And depending on you know, what kind of thing you're away for. Um, also, uh, what kind of support you you get along with it. And I think that's really um, important. Like if it's an, if it's a deployment or, you know, like an international or national, like you are on a named operation, for example, um, there's quite a bit more support. So Tom did two tours in Afghanistan. And again, it was like quite standard, you know, between you know six months to a year of workup training, six to eight months away, he did two of those quite close together. Um, but then the next time um, he was deployed, it was on like 24 hours notice. He was on Roto Zero for what, it's morphed into different things, but it was sort of um, in response to the Russians. So he was over in like Poland and, and Latvia and he, and he had 24 hours notice to move. Um, you know, we had just come, come that one was tough because his dad had just passed away and we had just come back from compassionate leave and it was like his first day back to work and he called me and he's like I'm leaving and I was like I'm sorry what <laughs> you know like really and he's like I, I like I can't tell you anything I don't know where I'm going they're you know working on our passports like I'm gonna come home and pack and I was like when will I see you and he was like I I have no idea right. um so that one was tough you know he did the floods um in Calgary also tough because we were getting married that summer and I was expecting him to, you know, come home. Um, yeah, luckily we didn't make it home in, in time for us to get married. Um, and then his final one was, it just sort of popped up out of the blue. It was like a little six week uh, deployment to the Middle East to do some training. And it was something he was really interested in. So again, like no workup training, he was just gone, but sort of like him, Tom is constantly, except for his time in Kingston, been away training all over the place. They train with the Americans, they train, you know, all over the US, they train all over Canada. Um, and those can be several months at a time. And then he goes on courses anytime he wanted to be promoted. There's like a big course that goes along with it. So that's like three or four months, you know, and, and so the benchmark for me is when our um, son was first born in 2015, he had no deployments scheduled. And yet he was away for eight of the 12 months. Right. Not consecutively. Um, and again, like I said, there's 
you know, again, no one really explains it to you. They're like, when he's on a deployment, you have support, deployment coordinator, there's HLTA, there's people that you can call, you know, they're very invested, you know, some, some of the bases do a better job than others and the spouses. When they're on exercise, like they're just gone. It's like you just kind of fend for yourself. Um, even though they're gone and they're still not very reachable, um, you know, they're they're absent nonetheless. Yeah, they're right? they're absent and they're, you know, they're really not reachable. Um, you know, obviously if there's an emergency, like a real honest to God emergency, like they're reachable. You know, but that that's about it. Um, so it's it's just like a very different tempo. And especially for for army, they're away a lot, constantly training. And I think like so many of my friends who aren't military, they just figured if Tom wasn't in Afghanistan or some sort of exotic locale, he was just I don't know, pushing paper like nine to five, like they had no concept that in order for them to be able to deploy, they have to practice. You can't just like do nothing and hang out at the garrison and then they hand you a gun and they're like, off you go to Afghanistan boys. Like it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, so when I would say to them, yeah, like I, Tom's away for three months, four months, five months, they'd be like, why? What? Yeah. What is he doing? Yeah. Um, so that was sort of interesting. And I would say something I wish I knew that yeah it's a very different tempo in the reserves he's around all year away for the summer not that way in the reg force right no I, I think that's 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 really critical I think that's something again that a lot of the general population doesn't understand when they think of military and you know I think generally speaking you know a civilian population can think like oh deployment overseas name mission okay I get that but like how do you prepare for that and where are you while you're preparing for that? And how much time does that take away from your family? Um, Mel, coming back to you, you talked about what it's like um, in the world of uh, SAR, something that you wish you had known. Um, is there something that at the beginning of your SAR experience as a family that you know somebody had told you in terms of what family life would look like? You have to be able to be a co-parent and a parent. There's no option to be one or the other because there's a lot of challenges to them being away that much. Um, I think the misconception is that we get a lot of notice for those army deployments. Um, so people assume that if they're going away for six to eight months, we must know well in advance, right? No, I went to um, Wainwright back in 2007 in my last year in the military and a group of armored crewmen had down to Wainwright for a training exercise. They were not slated to go to Afghanistan. And then everything changed. And they had literally 48 hours notice that they were going to Afghanistan. And they only had 12 hours at home because we had to get them ready to go. And we did that in Wainwright. So those spouses, those families at home had 12 hours to prepare. Um, so for my husband and I, when we were raising our kids, we're still raising our kids while we're raising our kids. <laughs> yeah. They're not like running fair. We're definitely still here. parenting them. <laughs> um, there are a lot of times that we will, he will say, I, I would like us to do this or we'll talk about something that we want to do with our kids. And I will say, that's fine. That's something I'm prepared to do when you are at home, but it's not in full when you're away. So screen time obviously is one of those things like when our kids were really little and we're discussing whether or not they can have 30 minutes of screen time a day or like have an hour a week or you know it's a big discussion now um i said i'm i'm good with little screen time when you're home but there's no limit away i'm just we're just going to do what we need to do to make things work and i can't enforce this rule when you're gone and that being able to play that dual role to be able to co-parent when they're home and then to switch over and be a single parent when they're gone and then to switch back and still include them. So I know lots of parents who've said that um, when they've come home from longer absence, the kids will be like, dad will give an order or whichever parent was away will give an order. And they'll be like, yeah, but did the parent who stays at home say that? Mom say it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's a really big challenge that I don't think most of us are prepared for. 
No, I think that's a really critical, I, I think you've hit a lot of really interesting points. I want to put a hold on the raising kids situation though, because that is my next question. And I, and I have a lot of questions about that. Kim, in terms of your experiences with Nathan and, and, you know, to your point, this is the first time in what, 23 years, he's been home for a significant period of time. Um, you know, is there anything that you wish you had known to prepare you for those frequent absences? Um, or, you know, at the beginning, or like, is there something that you learned along the way after several absences where you're like, oh, I wish I'd known this earlier, would have made my life that much easier? Um, <laughs> Parenting wise, like life wise, I couldn't have managed the first decade without being willing to accept community help. Like, I can't, I, I do meet a lot of parents now that are very um, closed off. I think COVID hasn't helped. It's become very, you know, independent and insular. Um, I remember seeing memes all the time that said things like, you know, if someone rings my doorbell, they hate that. Or if some, you know, why is someone calls me or someone? And I always kind of think like, oh yeah, you know what? I don't like, you know, random unannounced visitors that I don't like either. And I don't, you know, want to answer, but at the same time, it, it has created kind of a very um, independent, closed off um, community. And um, I don't think, and maybe it's just me. I know some parents that will go their whole child's life and they've, they'll never accept support or babysitters or things like that. Um, I could not have done that. There's just absolutely no way. My kids were raised by friends they were raised by and, and we don't live near family and we haven't it's not close enough that they could you know watch the kids or be dropped off or whatever so I mean my kids we had New Year's Eve we had people over at our place sorry it's like bragging to people in Ontario we had people over on New Year's Eve and uh, what was that like <laughs> <laughs> just a few people but like very close friends of ours that my kids have known since they were very very little and I mean my daughter's like you know falling asleep on top of this like very large bearded older man that she's known her whole life that probably looks scary to other people and I mean my son's you know dragging them around to show them his music and his things and um they've just they've created this kind of group and friends and I couldn't if I didn't have people that were driving me to the hospital when I went into labor or people that were you know watching my kids when I was sick or stuff like like I couldn't have managed so I, I guess the only thing that I really absolutely needed to learn was how imperative it was going to be to um, accept help. And I think one of my biggest lessons um, is that you can't create a community if you only give support, um, then you've just created an outreach program. <laughs> the only way that you create community is if you accept support as well as give it. Otherwise, people feel like a charity case. They need to know that if you're there for them, that they would also be allowed to be there for you. And I think that that was hard for me to understand, um, but like probably legitimately saved my kids' lives at different points because I needed to, um, I can very distinctly remember picking up my toddler, sticking them in the car, like just so that they could be out of my arm's reach so I could go for a drive. Cause I'm like, you are in danger right now. I need to be separated from you. Yeah. So yeah, I think of all the things, while I don't think that I could have, um, I don't think it would have been a good idea to tell 19 year old me all of the absolute garbage that was going to happen as some kind of scare tactic. I do, um, think that she probably could have learned earlier, uh, when to accept help and how to accept help and, you know, the ways that it would benefit her so that she didn't end up, you know, desperate and in crisis before she would ask for support. Because if you ask first, you can avoid, you know, ending up on the floor of the bathroom, calling someone to pick up your kids kind of thing. So. No, I, I think that's a really good point. And you both have transitioned into this raising kids question perfectly. So I want to go over to Elle for a minute. Um, Elle, you have uh, been part of a military, all of you have been part of a military family, both with children and without children. Um, what is it like to raise a child when the, when the other half of your family is in the military? How, how do you navigate that? I would say um, I wish Kim had slapped me around when I was younger because 40 odd year old me like is still not very good at accepting help. And I think that it's having worked with you, I can attest to that. You hate <laughs> accepting help. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, things certainly would have been easier at a, a number of, you know, different points early in Ethan's life. You know, I'm still not great at accepting help, but I, you know, through different circumstances, I'm sort of like forced to. Um, 
I mean, it was it was very interesting because I think um, before I had Ethan was when Tom did um, all but one of his deployments and it was way easier without children, I have to say, just for me. Like I traveled a ton for my job. So I was always out and about and I was never like really home, you know, sort of like missing him because I was just never home. Like we had fur babies um, who were, you know, that I had to accept help for because they couldn't come with me. Um, so rather than go bankrupt, boarding them all the time, there was a lot of like, oh, please, can you come and stay at my house and look after this dog or that cat and I'll be home in, you know, a week or so. Um, but I think raising kids was a whole other level of challenge, um, you know, par like particularly with Tom either deploying or just being away for that whole first year of Ethan's life um, because I didn't stop traveling for work. Yeah. Ethan, who's our son, racked up a lot of air miles. I was in luckily enough to work for a job that was like incredibly supportive of me being a working mom, you know, to the point that like I ran conferences with a baby strapped to me, you know, also luckily he was a very good child and I had to learn to accept help, you know, it was past the parcel when I was teaching, um, you know, he learned to just like hang out in the hospitality suite and fall asleep on me until 1.30 in the morning when I was ready to put him down properly. Um, I think it would have been different if he was a more challenging um, in, child for sure. But I think raising kids like when Tom was away was, was very tough. Um, he did a short deployment and I say it was like the worst six weeks of my life. Anything that could go wrong did go wrong. And, you know, he was so far away, like there, and I'm not good at accepting help, you know, see first point. And so it was everything from like hospital visits to Ethan, to me, you know, getting sick and driving myself to, you know, urgent care with a child and bursting into tears, um, you know, in the, in the office, like my cat getting sick, my car breaking down, the nanny quitting, whatever was going to go wrong did go wrong. And I did it by myself. And I wish that I had not like, when I would tell my friends like the funny anecdotes like three days after they'd be like are you an idiot like why didn't you call me and it, you know for me it was like well you're not military and you guys didn't have kids and they're like but we're your friends and we love you like we would have come and held the baby right you know um mm -hmm. so that was like you know a tough a tough thing in terms of like raising kids and I think for me the hardest is when they're little like the reintroduction of the parent Ethan learned to walk when Tom was deployed and he was little and he was just with me. And I thought, isn't this gonna be like a great Kodak moment? Um, I'm gonna take him to the airport and I'm gonna put him down and he's gonna see his dad and he's gonna walk to his dad and it's gonna be like this hallmark moment. No, he was running around the airport and then this strange man approaches him and he's like, I'm not walking and who the F are you? <laughs> you know, and he was like just over a year and Tom was, upset understandably I was upset you know not on my child um but you know there goes that lovely plan and so it took a while for Ethan to kind of get used to having Tom around again and then he was gone yeah again um and I think that's really tough you know for for little kids for any age like Ethan's still only six and um you know we have sort of an unusual living situation like he's got some challenges so it's better if he's here in Toronto you know and Tom's still in Kingston so that like it's getting easier the older he gets right. the reintegration piece but I wish I don't know that there were every child is going to be different but just sort of like a general what to what to expect in mm -hmm. and around there um you know and the thing that I kind of worry about is you know I've talked to lots of friends who were who were you know children of military families and you know hearing them moving from place to place it's very you know on the one hand exciting on the other hand kind of unsettled and I don't think anyone, like, they don't get to choose. They're, you know, born into this. And, you know, I know lots of families who, who include their children in some of this, those choices. I think I would, you know, likely be a parent that's more like that. Um, but it's, uh, it's totally different than being on my own. Not better. You know, I love having Ethan around, like when Tom was deployed, but just, it's challenging. Different. Different. Kim, I want to go back to what you said in terms of, of raising kids. And I think you brought up a really interesting point. 
for those who are listening today and maybe are kind of embarking on this for the first time, you talked about, you know, kind of telling yourself that you needed to accept help, um, you know, get, get some help before that crisis begins, um, you know, and, and give the help and accept the help. If you are deployed, um, sorry, excuse me, if you are posted and you are far from family, how do you make those connections with individuals who can offer you that support? How do you create that community so you get that support? By force. By force. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, I'll, I'll put that out to both Kim and, and to Mel. Like, how, did, how, does that, how does that work? Like, how, did, how do you, you know, you're like, hi, uh, want to be my emergency contact? Or like, how does that work? So shameless choir plug, because they're my heart. Um, but so my choir took, uh, Jesse J's and you're talking about the Canadian military wives choir. Just to be I am talking about the Canadian military wives choir. Um, we took two songs, uh, Bill Withers lean on me and Jesse J's flashlight and mashed them together because to us, they just told them as the story of the military spouse. So Jesse J starts out singing that song. She says, when tomorrow comes, I'll be all alone, feeling frightened and on my own. And how many times has a military spouse, you know, seen their spouse out the door at four o'clock in the morning because they're headed off to wherever it is that they're going. And there never comes a time in your military journey that you will have everything figured out. There is going to be something that trips you up. There is going to be something that is a challenge you didn't see coming. And you are going to need those military spouses that are around you that know what you're going through. And somebody has been there and they can understand you and they know exactly what you're going through. And if you're not willing to call the people at your brand new unit and be like, hey, today, is a, today sucks. I don't even know why today sucks, but today is hard. Then you're, you are, you're choosing to be alone. And those spouses are going to be the Bill Withers part of the song comes back and they say, well, lean on me because I've been there and I'm gonna need that support from you someday. And that I think, is the hallmark of the military spouse is that we are going to be there to prop you up and to support you. And there will come a day that we're going to have something and we're going to need you too. So it's just, it no, is a give and take awesome. relationship and it's recognizing that you just need it. You have to have it and you have to I be able to rely on those strangers. I think that's amazing. Actually, Kim, I want to, uh, I want to give you a plug for a second here, because, you know, when we talk about community, I can't think of anybody who's built a stronger military spouse community than you. Um, you have a community, uh, you started, I, I think you started as a blog, am I right? Yeah. Yeah, you started as a blog, and it's known as She is Fierce. Um, and now you have like a crazy following of spouses that um, and I and I totally follow you. I like stalk you a little bit online. I'm like, oh, what's, what's happening today? Um, and um, you have then I don't have any good stories to tell because everybody already knows them. And then they, <laughs> they smile and nod politely when I'm talking in conversation. And then like a half an hour later, they'll be like, yeah, I read it on She is Fierce. I'm like, why did you let me tell you all these stories? <laughs> no, but I love it. Tell, tell everybody um, at home what She is Fierce is and, and what that community looks like and, and why you built it. I think that I didn't intend to build it. She has first happened accidentally because I made a blog um, at the request of a journalist for something many, many years ago. Um, and then it just kind of turned into to what it is. Um, and I, and it's because I'm a firm believer in things like the Canadian Military Wives Choir, which you can all thank me later that I'm not part of. However, <laughs> I think they're very important uh, because it's just about finding a thing that you're into um, that's going to connect you with the people that are like-minded to you, right? And the Wives Choir has been phenomenal for that. I see so many people all over the country talk about the groups that they found that way. Um, there is, a, a, and I found this strictly by chance, there is a Canadian military spouse felting craft group on on Facebook. Like, so there are like a group of military spouses who found a community because they all like felt crafts. This is like weird to me. And then I That's didn't know thing. that there wow. was more than one person who existed that was into that. However, like how cool that they found like a bunch of people who like the stuff that they like, like, um, there's the Canadian military spouse book club. Um, there's all these different ways. And I mean, the internet is a beautiful thing and we've been able to connect with people and stay connected to people as we've moved on. Um, it amazes me, my kids, because they're teenagers now, like the people that I would have, we would have probably lost touch with if we moved that much. My kids are all friends still on Snapchat and for whatever else things that they're on. Um, and they still find connections that way. 
Um, the whole point of She is Fierce at this point is just enabling people to find those positive connections. Because you're right, if people aren't willing to do just the minimum to be able to go out there and seek help and offer help when they need it, and there's nothing that we can do to push or you know make things easier a lot of times I do sit in front of spouses and I'm like unless you're willing to do one thing to meet someone new there's nothing more I can help you with the MFRC depending where you live is going to have different services it is important to kind of note that that has actually changed in recent years and I think it's really cool that they have changed what deployment means in terms of services and now deployment is any absence at all that's work related and so they are offering services to that which I think is kind of a cool sidebar but again those are just services being received they're not a community that you're creating and the MFRC isn't going to be there at two in the morning when one kid has to go to the hospital and the other two kids are sleeping and you don't want to wake them up and they're not you know they're not going to be the ones to answer those questions or you know, swap childcare or do any of the things that, you know, you need to do to get your life together. So I think that, you know, it, not everyone is going to be into the same weird, I was going to swear, definitely. No, not everybody's going to be into the same weird things that I am, but that's okay because there's probably someone out there that's going to be into your weird things. And <laughs> the internet has like, you know, blessed us with this ability to meet all the people that are into the same weird crap that we're into. And you're going to be able to like make those connections and you can do it on your base too, but like it requires you are on your wing or I mean, 85% of military families live off base. It's not new and exciting. The amount of times that I hear like I'm just not one of those military spouses like I haven't met that particular spouse that they're all talking about like they're all different. And most of us live off base and most of us have, you know, other things going on in our lives. I I work, um, I work for the town that I live in. Um, you know, I have other career goals and aspirations and I have, you know, three children that are all going through different things, but like my second child is going to graduate next year. That'll be the second time my spouse won't be home for a graduation. He missed my son's graduation. And I mean, I know that it, it was very, very hard. I cannot go back. I don't even want to think about it. I've blocked out a lot of having very small children while, you know, trying to navigate on my own. Um, but at the same time, you know, seeing my son get his driver's license and seeing my son graduate and my son graduate basic training and all of those things while his dad was gone was just as hard as watching them take their first step and take, especially for my husband who realized that, you know, he missed all those first steps. And then he also missed all of those graduations and those things too. Um, but my son's basic training graduation, we had 24 people come because I asked if anybody from our military community wanted to come and support him because his dad wasn't going to be there. And we had 24 military members and their families show up. They had to put out extra chairs for us. Um, it was beautiful and wonderful. And I had to ask, right? Like I had to do that. And I, I think that if anything, I want She is Ferris to say is that like, I have the community I show, I get a lot that people are like, I just don't have those people in my life. You're lucky that you have these, these friends, these communities. I mean, I, I am fortunate that I have them, but like I had to work my ass off <laughs> to get that too. I had to put in the effort and I had to, you know, give as much as I've gotten from them. I hope that I've managed to do that. And I've had to, you know, go out there and find the people and send the messages and accept the help when it was hard. Um, and that's how you end up with 24 people at your kid's graduation when he's 18 years old and, you know, finishing basic training, being all embarrassed because now he has 24 military family members and military members watching him graduate, watching him salute and do all his drill and all of that stuff. And you know darn well that all these combat soldiers are just like taking photos to show his dad <laughs> about his bad form or his wrong arm placement or whatever it was. So, um, yeah, that's what she is fierce is. I don't know. It's creating that I've been really lucky to end up with it. And I think that it's something we can all work for. So no, I think that's great. And I actually can't believe we're at the top of the hour already. That that was a really, really fast hour for me. I don't know about you. Um, I, I love talking to the three of you. And, I, and I'm so happy that the three of you were able to speak about this particular topic today. And, and for me, 
um, you know, for those who are listening who might be starting off on this journey or maybe are having a hard time navigating this journey, um, the takeaways for me are, are you know, the, the, the critical ones are that the three of you touched on is that the experience is so different that, that, you know, you're not, you can't come in with this like pre, uh, pre prescribed notion of like, this is what your life is going to be like, that you kind of have to go with the flow and you have to be able to navigate that. And you have to be all in if you're going to navigate that. But it sounds, you know, really from, from what I got, um, L, even though you weren't necessarily willing to accept it, um, Mel, you knew it was there. And, and Kim, you certainly fought to build your own, like the support is there within this amazing community. Um, I've yet to meet a military family um, and, and I've been privileged enough to meet quite a few who haven't been there to be like, I will be here to support you. Like any question you have, I will be here to help you navigate that. And I think by building that community, maybe your experiences won't be the same, but you will certainly have that support while you go through it. So um, I commend all three of you for the amazing work that you do within your own communities. Um, and I thank all three of you for being here with me tonight. It was so special to, uh, to see you and have you be uh, the first show of 2022. So thank you all. Thank you. I have like one final note. Please do. Kim said really well, but you know, the main advice I would give to, you know, my, my night, my, you know, 23, 24 year old self is um, like really be proactive. Things aren't just going to happen to you. Like, like you have to make them happen. And I think so many people watch a lot of American TV where these things just sort of like magically appear and, and they miss the you know, six months of like, you know, building that. Um, mm -hmm. And we're a very like different country and a different military in terms of that. Like you have to go outside and, and seek these things out. Um, and, you know, even if you're shy, you know, like me a little bit, like I didn't necessarily look within the military for my community, but wherever I was, I found that something, you know, out like outside um, mm -hmm. of it but I also could very easily have been not proactive. And I think the experiences would have been, would have been very different. So I wish someone had like really hammered that home, um, you know, to me before I jumped in with both feet into the, the military lifestyle, like our, like, for example, Tom's unit, like the, like the army guys don't get together. They see each other at work, but there's no like big things that happen, you know, that include the families. Like, maybe once a year we were invited to, you know, official stuff, um, which is a very different representation than we see. Yeah. No, and I, and I, think that's a, I think that's a really good point. And I think to all of your points, you know, what life looked like maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, in terms of helping to build a military community for mm -hmm. um, families looks so different. So, you know, take advantage of groups like the Military Wives Choir, mm -hmm. like the Military Book Club, well, uh, Spouse Book Club, like She is Fierce, like all of these communities that are mm -hmm. around um, that exist already um, or the, you know, felt um, what is it? The, fel the arts the and fel the filters. filters. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be something out there. And the beauty of it is that um, individuals like the three of you are always willing to, you know, I, I've, I've yet to see the three of you not be able to uh, lend a hand when we have somebody who has a question. So thank you, all of you. Um, I thank you. all of the Thanks, all of you at home for, for watching tonight. And uh, I can't wait to have the three of you back again. Thanks, I had a final Steph. closing thought as well, really quickly. Yeah. Um, Man, you guys have closing thoughts today. So many thoughts. <laughs> this is the life we chose. This is the life that we choose every single day and we want to make the bed. And it's really easy to be able to sit back and find the negatives and to complain and to, you know, feel sorry for yourself. This is the life we choose every single day and we want to make the best of it. We want to make it better for the spouses coming behind us. We love being here. And that is why military families are so badass because you really do. <laughs> you guys go through a, a, a tremendous amount and you always manage to find the positivity behind it. So I can't leave us with anything else other than that. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye guys. Have a great Bye. day. You too.